Section 11 of Magna Carta Commemoration Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ruth Golding. Magna Carta and the Common Law by Charles Howard McKilwain, Professor of History and Government, Harvard University. Part 4 one more point in regard to enactment seems in need of explanation before we are in position to form a true estimate of magna carta at this time and that is the legal necessity and the legal effect of the publication of statutes the sealing engrossing and publication are the outward marks of an early statute the procedure is so fully described in the introduction to the statutes of the realm that it need not be repeated here their publication however was so important a part of the authentication of statutes in early times that a statute is usually referred to before the middle of the fourteenth century as statutum editum in a certain parliament or year the theory of representation is found surprisingly early in england but so long as the composition of parliament was uncertain publication in the counties must have been of even greater importance than it was afterward it is probable that some doubt existed in this period as to the reality of the assent omnium utentium unless a statute had been actually proclaimed locally throughout the realm this probability is strengthened by the cases where the king who alone could give effect to an enactment saw fit temporarily to suspend its operation in the later middle ages there is considerable evidence of the existence of a suspending power on the part of the king notwithstanding the summary dismissal of it as pretended by the parliament in sixteen eighty nine it seems certain however that when the composition of parliament settled down into its final form such doubts if they existed were swept away by the full acceptance of the theory that the whole body of the people were constructively in parliament and therefore were bound by all its statutes on their mere enactment without publication though the publication was actually continued until the invention of printing made it no longer necessary this view was stated with vigour and clearness in the thirty-ninth regnal year of edward the third in the case of rex versus the bishop of chichester the prosecution was under the statute of provisors and sergeant cavendish counsel for the bishop set up as a part of his defence that this enactment was not binding because it had not been published in the counties he was answered by sir robert thorpe the chief justice quote, granting that proclamation was not made in the county nevertheless every one is considered to know what is done in parliament for so soon as parliament has concluded anything the law presumes that every person has notice of it for the parliament represents the body of all the realm wherefore it is not necessary to have proclamation where the statute took effect before End quote it now remains to apply these deductions to magna carta and to edward the first's mandate requiring its enforcement by his judges as common law john's charter was in form a royal grant guaranteeing rights almost all of which had already existed by feudal custom or otherwise it was granted primarily to his tenants-in-chief and their homines it was a feudal rather than a national document and the grantees were probably then conceived to include none lower than vavasours but the reign of henry the third was from the point of view of the development of institutions almost a revolutionary epoch the loss of normandy and other influences brought about in this period a remarkable development in the idea of nationality which is reflected in the growth of the national assembly and in other respects this influence can be seen in magna carta in addition to the extension of john's articles on the forest into a new separate and more detailed charter magna carta itself was reissued three times 
with new clauses defining interpreting and enlarging some of the original articles of a permanent nature and omitting the parts obviously temporary in addition it was solemnly confirmed by an excommunication against all who should break or change it and it was confirmed by the statute of marlborough an examination of these documents and incidental inferences in other writings of this reign official and non-official leads to the conclusion that contemporary ideas of the nature of magna carta greatly changed during this period it was now seen that this was more than a carta libertatum it was a carta libertatis though originally granted only to feudal homines it was now applied to all liberi homines though conceded at first as by royal favour in this period it comes to be regarded as a solemn affirmance of fundamental rights guaranteed to all and approved by all for the year twelve twenty five the annals of dunstable in speaking of the reissue of magna carta in that year say that in the colloquium generale in london quote, post multas vero sententiarum revolutiones communiter placuit quod rex tam populo quam plebi libertates prius ab eo puero concessas iam maior factus indulcit the sentence of excommunication in twelve fifty three condemns all who shall violate infringe diminish or change the rights of the church the ancient and approved customs of the realm et praecipue libertates et liberas consuetudines quae in cartis communium libertatum et de foresta continentur bracton calls the third reissue of magna carta constitutio libertatis or constitutio merely and as we have seen magna carta is referred to officially in the nineteenth regnal year of edward the first as statutum de runnymede the author of the mirror of justices mentions it as la constitution de la chartre des franchises by twelve ninety seven it has become la grand chartre des franchises d'angleterre proclaimed pour le commun profit du peuple et du royaume or magna carta domini henrici quondam regis angliae de libertatibus angliae though to pope clement v it is only concessiones warii et iniquae by the time the word statute has come to have a definite meaning we begin to find that term also applied to magna carta in the fifteenth regnal year of edward the third the commons strengthen one of their petitions by reference to quote, les points de la grande chartre faits par les nobles rois et ses progéniteurs et les grands du royaume sage et noble à donc pierre de la terre et puis souvent confirmé de divers rois et puis mult des autres ordonnances et statuts faits pour profit du commun peuple entendant les points de la dite chartre ensemblement ou les autres perpétuellement à durer sans être enfin sinon par accord et à son des pierres de la terre et ce en plein parlement in fourteen thirty two the commons appeal to the statute of the great charter confirmed by divers other statutes thus it is clear that magna carta had come to be considered an enactment much in the original sense of a statute in affirmance of ancient law the quotation above from the roll of the fifteenth regnal year of edward the third brings this out clearly it also shows that magna carta was regarded as common law with its interpretations it is such statements as this that enable us to put magna carta in its true setting in the fourteenth century but there is another phrase in the same quotation from the roll of the fifteenth regnal year of edward the third a pui mult magna carta while much the same in character as other statutes 
in binding force is classed far above them while it is said they may be changed in parliament this statement does not include magna carta itself we shall see later that this distinction was constantly made magna carta had in fact from the time of henry the third been recognized as in some sense a law fundamental henry the third's reissue of twelve twenty five was the form considered final we have evidence of this as early as bracton's time in a quotation given above bracton says a writ is to be quashed si impetratum fuerit contra jus et regni consuetudinem et maxime contra cartam libertatis the author of the mirror in his fifth book de abusion begins with magna carta comme la loi de ce royaume fondée sur quarante points de la grande chartre des franchises soit désusée damnablement par les guilleurs de la loi et par un statut plus fait contrario à aucun de ces points he then proceeds to enumerate the default of the various articles of the charter implying that they are in affirmance of the law fondi sur droit though in some cases incomplete defectif but he has no doubt that they render invalid destruit any subsequent statute inconsistent with them and he declares what is said of this statute merton is to be understood of all statutes made after the first making of the great charter in the time of henry the third for it is not law that any one should be punished for a single deed by imprisonment or any other corporal punishment and in addition by a pecuniary punishment or ransom in the fourteenth regnal year of edward the first the sheriffs of london had been violating the article of magna carta guaranteeing judgment by peers Quote, et justicarii dicunt quod dominus rex hoc nullo modo concedere secundum magnam cartam angliae sed est ultra regiam potestatem et contra omnem justitiam etc the so-called statute de talagio non concedendo provides that if against the ancient laws and liberties or against any article of magna carta any statute had been published by the king or his predecessors or any customs introduced such statutes and customs quote, vacua et nulla sint in perpetuum end quote we have seen that the confirmation which was actually enacted at that time declared null not previous acts but jugement donné désormais the terms of the letters patent of confirmation in 1301 are very interesting there it is declared that quote, si que statuta furent contraria dictis cartis well aliqui articulo in eistem cartis contento ea de communi concilio regni nostri modo debito emendentur well echiam ad nullentur the difference between this provision and that of the confirmation of twelve ninety seven as well as the possible relation of both to the provision in the so-called statute de talagio non concedendo is very significant by thirteen o one the normal way of obtaining the common council of the realm on the amendment or annulling of any law the modus debitus had certainly become an enactment by parliament an accord or judgment of parliament was le plus haut le plus solemn jugement de cette terre an award fait en la plus haute place en le royaume whether in dealing with magna carta parliament should act in its judicial capacity or in a legislative way by statute no more effective sanction could be devised in those days the confirmation of thirteen o one must be considered as an honest attempt to secure enforcement in the most effective manner known of the provisions of magna carta it would seem fair to say then that magna carta was considered a really fundamental law and that the confirmation of thirteen o one first authorized the manner of confirming it 
which was regularly followed until all confirmations ceased. After this confirmation, no additions were made to the charter, and it became the custom to confirm it as a matter of course at the beginning of each parliament. This is as near to a fundamental law as the conceptions of medieval Englishmen could reach. We should not expect to find more. Parliament was not content in the years following merely to confirm Magna Carta. It occasionally declared in general terms that all inconsistent acts should be void. The famous ordinances of 1312 declared that any such acts soit tenu pour nul et tout autrement défait. In 1368, in response to the Commons' petition, the King promised that the charters should be observed and that any statute passed à contrari soit tenu pour nul. The statutes of that year add these words to the usual confirmation. In 1376, the Commons complain of infringements of Magna Carta par sinistre interprétation d'aucun genre de loi, and pray that it be observed notwithstanding any statute, ordinance or charter to the contrary. The same request was made in another Parliament in the same year. A similar one is found in 1379. In the first regnal year of Henry IV, the Commons petitioned for the repeal of a statute of the King's grandfather, which they alleged to be expressement fait en contre la tenure et fait de la grande chartre. In 1397, Parliament declared the award of Parliament against the dispensers void, as against law, right and reason, and against Magna Carta. In 1341, the peers prayed that infringements of Magna Carta should be declared in Parliament, and par les pierres de la terre du mont redressé. During the 14th and 15th centuries, the practice continued of confirming Magna Carta, as is proved by both the Parliament and the statute roll but it would serve no purpose to refer to any of these numerous confirmations, which are usually brief and stereotyped in form. The regularity of the practice was recognised in 1381, in a petition of the Commons praying, Since by the Great Charter it was ordained and affirmed, communement en tous autres parlements, that law be not denied or sold to any one, that therefore fees be no longer taken by the Chancellor for writs. The confirmations of these years vary in the comprehensiveness of their statements, but they almost invariably include Magna Carta, the Charter of the Forest, and former statutes. In the 15th century the reference to these statutes, but not to the charters, is usually limited by the phrase E ni en repelle. Sometimes the Commons try to go further than a mere confirmation. In 1341, they petitioned that all the great officers of the realm be sworn to observe Magna Carta and the other laws and statutes, that Magna Carta be publicly read and affirmed by oath, and that penalties be inflicted on sheriffs or other ministers of the king who failed to enforce its observance. In 1354, they petitioned for the reading of Magna Carta. In 1377, at the opening of the new reign, the Commons again asked that it be read in Parliament, and this was done. It was read again in the Parliament of 1380. Occasionally there is a demand that the Charter be not merely read, but officially interpreted. In 1377 this demand goes further. The Charter was not only to be read, but it was to be declared point by point by the members of the Continual Council, with the advice of the judges and sergeants or others, if necessary. The points so declared and amended, were to be submitted to the Lords and Commons at the next Parliament, and then être encressé et affirmé pour estatut s'il semble à eux qu'il soit à faire. Ayant regard de comment le roi est chargé à sa couronnement de tenir et garder la dite chartre en tous ses points. The king, in general terms, promised that it be read and observed, but ignored the request for interpretation. 
if space permitted many instances might also be given of parliament's solicitude not merely for general confirmations of the charter but also for the observance of its specific provisions by the courts magna carta in the later middle ages is looked upon and treated as an enactment in affirmance of fundamental common law to be confirmed and observed as a part of that law but undoubtedly all other enactments of such law are regarded as pui mult the evolution of a constitutional law in america has generally been considered by british writers as without precedent in earlier english institutions such a view is hardly supported by a study of those institutions in the middle ages before the modern doctrine of the legislative sovereignty of parliament had taken definite form but it seems hardly possible completely to identify the fundamental law of medieval england with the usual modern forms of such a law in fact the content of that law of which magna carta is the best example was not entirely nor mainly constitutional rigid constitutions are a development of modern times to us it seems natural to place the framework of government in a class by itself we think of it alone as the fundamental law we go so far as to make of fundamental and constitutional practically equivalent terms this was not done in medieval england for the englishman of that day the fundamental law did indeed include the law of the crown but it included also the law of the realm and the second bulked larger than the first even what we might be tempted to call the law of the constitution was in those days what it still remains in england and even in great measure in the united states notwithstanding our written constitutions quote, little else than a generalization of the rights which the courts secure to individuals end quote though this be true an added interest is undoubtedly given to a study of the earlier manifestations of the idea of a law fundamental by the growing tendency in certain quarters in england arising out of the recent and almost revolutionary constitutional changes to demand that the structure of the state be placed above and beyond the possibility of change by the ordinary law-making organ End of section eleven.